Okay, so the first session, we're going to talk about structure of the defense. Okay, coach, go ahead. All right, first of all, this is our defensive philosophy. Now, when I came to Emmett, they were really, really bad on defense. Okay, they were giving up 51 points a game. Over time, we've made a tremendous amount of progress. This year, I was really proud of them. We actually gave up 17.2, I think, points per game. We were the number one ranked defense in the league. And obviously, as our defense has improved, we've started winning more and more games. Okay? <laughs> I'm a, I guess you could say, offensive guy. I don't really view it that way. I sell books on offense. I sell systems on offense. I get that. But to me, there is no, I'm a defensive guy, I'm an offensive guy. If you're a head coach, you better be able to call both sides of the ball. And the guy that taught me to coach, really, um, I can remember him telling me that. He's like, Rich, here's the deal. At some point, a guy's going to get fired, a guy's going to get sick, a guy's going to have family problems, and all of a sudden, he's going to walk in and go, I can't coach. What are you going to do? You better be able to call both sides. Well, obviously, I call the offense. That's not a problem. Over the years, I've taught myself to be able to call the defense. Now, the issue comes with... Our DC, super smart guy, very cerebral. He has a certain way he likes to call it. I don't like it because it's got a lot of moving parts, but it works. Our kids get it. Our coaches get it. They work well together. So I basically just go over there and piss them off by trying to simplify things, right? Um, and sometimes they just have to tell me to shut up and get out of the room because I do tinker with it a little too much. But these are our base philosophical thoughts. We have to be the most physical. We tell our kids... Football is the last frontier of people being allowed to be violent legally. And you better embrace it. Because if you don't, you're not going to be good on defense. I hear people trying to do all this feng shui, I live in 2022 version of defense. No, I have to physically dominate you. I have to break you down. And if I'm not willing to do that and I'm not willing to coach that way, then you're going to give up points. And I would say this, the days, and I, I can't believe it happened. We never in a million years thought we'd give up 17 points a game because we tell our kids all the time, the days of giving up 21 points is over. Offense rules the show now. We were very, very fortunate. Our kids played really hard. We did some good things. It used to be when I learned defense, it was, oh, we're going to try to hold people to two scores and 100 yards. Oh, my God, no. You hold somebody to 100 yards rushing, you better break some legs because they're going to find ways to get 100 yards. Okay, it used to be, well, we're going to hold that quarterback to 150 passing. That's never going to happen. If they want to throw the ball, they're throwing for 200. Just done. Most of them are going to throw for 300 if they want. We tell our kids what the opposition's allowed to do. We will tell them, these guys are allowed to throw for 250 yards. We do not care. But they're not running the ball. Or vice versa. We're going to let them run the ball. We had a team a couple years ago, and our kids were freaking out. They had four dudes that could go get it. They had no commitment to running the ball. So we said we are going to kill the run. In the embryo is what we say. Before it can even grow up, we're going to end the run. They rushed for 52 yards that night. Now they threw for 280. They scored 21 points and we beat them. Okay? Because we're going to make you play left-handed. Whatever you're good at, we're going to take away. Um, in Idaho, they have taken the spread pill. Uh, they all want to spread it out and throw it. Yeah. <laughs> in the South, we actually saw a little bit, like there's some wing T guys that have really stuck with the wing T. Um, we saw a triple option, flex bone triple option team. Those people need to go straight to hell. I hate them. Okay. Yeah. So we played a three, a team this year and they were honest to God. Wing T all the way. And that was tough because it's not something we see. We do have one team in our league that will run foot to foot, double tight, double wing. I mean, sniffer, superpower, pull one whole side of the line, old school. Yeah, it's nasty. But everybody else is some version of spread. And when people look at us on defense, they're all taller and they're all more athletic. So it feeds the narrative they think they can come out and just run by us. And it completely is a trap because that's what we're counting on. We're hoping that's your thought. Because we think we're more physical than you. Actually, we don't think, we know. And so we tell our kids, they're not gonna physically line up and take your lunch money. So the only way they're gonna beat you is they're gonna have to spread you out and make plays. 
and we think time's on our side with that, okay? Um, then we talk about being the most prepared. Our kids have to know what your DNA is. We talk about that all the time. What is the DNA of this team? Do they spread to run? Do they spread to throw? Is the quarterback going to beat you with his legs? Is he trying to beat you with his arm? Who's their guy? Who do we want to funnel the ball to? Who's the receiver that's not very good? He's probably the superintendent's son, right? He's out there because somebody owes somebody a favor. He ain't no good. He's just out there eating sandwiches. Make him catch the ball, right? Don't let the dude have it because he's probably a dude for a reason. Deny him the ball. Now, there's other weeks we'll say, hey, the dude is a dude and we can't stop the dude. But the second, third, and fourth guy are pretty freaking good too. So let's take them away and see how much of a dude like Knight the dude's going to have, right? It all depends on how you want to play it. Um, but our kids are hyper prepared. Our kids know what you're going to try to do to them. We're going to be prepared for everything you do. Um, but we don't worry about things we don't need to worry about. We, we don't attack walled cities. We know there's certain things you're going to get away with and it's just going to work and there's not much we can do about it. And that's okay. We're going to live with that. Our first priority is to stop the run. We fundamentally do not think the game has changed at all, ever. We think the game is exactly what the game has always been. You have to run the ball and stop the run. Now, everything in media and everything at coaching clinics, they're going to try to tell you that's not true. Oh, no, we're going to spread it out. We're going to throw it. That's true. You can spread it out. And you can aerate it around. You can throw for 500 yards, and you will win games. Tell me how many championships those teams have. Because I live in the northern half of the United States. You live in Canada. Sooner or later, the weather's not your friend. When I was in South Carolina, the spread teams had a lot more success because the weather stayed better longer. In Idaho, the weather is bad, and it's bad half the season. It rains, followed by snow, followed by more rain, followed by cold, mist, fog. So you got to be able to run the ball, and you got to stop the run. Now, there are teams that win the state title. The team that beat us in the state championship two years ago, they were in the spread every snap. We forced five turnovers. We did not turn the ball over, and they beat us by 21. Their outside receiver got offered by Iowa State this morning. He's got 17 Division I offers. I'm not sure if Jesus Christ could cover him. Okay? I, 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 don't, I mean, he's just that guy. I mean, we could put seven on him and you can't cover him. He's a dude. And the problem was, when we tried to take him away, the other guy, he was a dude. And then we tried to take him away, and the tight end was a dude. And the running back was a dude. And the quarterback threw three interceptions, and he was like, hey, let's see if I can throw four. Come on. He didn't care. Their offense is predicated on scoring the football. And they do not care about turnovers. Because they have people everywhere. They just want points. And to be quite honest, they earned it. They were better than us. And they're probably going to win it again this year. Okay, so at some point you just got to say it is what it is. Now we did stop the run. We made them throw the ball. The problem is they all damn caught it. And that was an issue. But we have done really well. Um, we're undefeated against air raid teams the last two years. We beat every air raid team we've played. Partially because we understand what it is and what it's not. The second priority is to take away the deep pass. I took my whole staff, I take my staff every year to a college, all expenses paid basically. I take them somewhere and I let them clinic and I let them socialize and we do lots of um, work on developing our practice schedule and all that. I took them to the University of Iowa last year. And Iowa starts out the presentation, they go, our goal on defense is no explosive plays given up. None, we give up no 20 yard plays. And we're like, okay, now let's talk scheme. They're like, we just did. We're in the 4-3, we play quarters, and we don't give up big plays. Now, they do some really cool line stunt stuff. I mean, some really cool stuff we got. But fundamentally, they just don't give up big plays. And I'm like, I'm asking questions, and they're like, hey, you play Ohio State, and you're Iowa, you better damn hang on. Because Ohio State's not trying to get four yards. They're going for haymaker, haymaker, haymaker. They got players, right? I mean, they got Olympic players out there. They're going for broke. You got to deny it. You got to make them be patient and eat up time and make them eat up plays. Well, Iowa's beat them, what, three times, I think, uh, the last few years. They've done really well with them. So we take away the deep ball. We're going to give you the routes that we think you can't win with. And then we're going to dare you to throw them all night long. And the dumbest guy on every football field is the OC. 
I know that because I'm one of them. Right? We had a game one night. We completed 15 hitches to the boundary. And of course, what do we do? Eventually, we throw a post and throw an interception. Right? You just, oh my God, we just can't keep throwing hitches. <laughs> yeah, you can. And we don't. Right? Quarterbacks are greedy. Play callers are greedy. Okay? So we're going to take away the run. We're going to take away your shot plays. And then we're going to make you throw controlled passes down the field. OCs don't want to be patient. And if the head coach is a former OC, he's needling them to score. And if he's a DC, he hates the fact they threw the ball to begin with. So there's that dynamic you have to play to a little bit. Then number five, no matter what the situation, make three plays and get off the field. I don't know how many times I hear my DC say that. We fumble, which by the way, we don't. We've lost two fumbles in two years. Okay? We've only had nine turnovers in two years, total. Okay, so we don't turn the ball, and we are pathologically crazy about ball security. We don't turn it over, but we turn you over. Okay? If we turn the ball over, our DC will get the kids together, and he's like, hey, make three plays, get off the field. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter the score. Doesn't matter field position. Nothing matters. You have to make three plays. You make three plays, they got to give us the ball back. If we have the ball, we win more often. Make three plays, get off the field. Okay, sounds kind of simple, but that's kind of what we're trying to do. Go ahead. Odd structure. We consider ourselves a base 3-4 defense. We come out of the 3-4 first. My DC is a 3-4 guy. He is an odd guy. He is a Pittsburgh Steelers odd guy. <laughs> I am 4-2-5 with a mortgage and a very nice lawnmower type guy. He is reckless. Let's go get him. Okay? I'm not. I like the 4 2 because I'm like, hey, you line up in that gap right there and don't let him run in that gap. Because I know, this is my opinion, defensive players do asinine things. Hey, stick to the A gap. Why are you in the C gap, son? I'm looking right here. You're in the C gap. Well, I thought I could make a play. Yeah, you did for them. That's why he's running 37 yards down there. They all want to be heroes. So I like the 4 2 5 because it's safe, it's simple, it's structured. He likes the 3-4 because he wants to come out there and force negative plays. So what are we? A hybrid. We're a 3-4, 4-2-5 team. We even get in the 3-3 stack some. We'll do that. So how much of that changes based on personality here? We're going to always install the odd. Done. Because like, that's his baby. So we're going to install that in, in spring, and it's going to be in. And then I spend the rest of the spring bitching about getting into a four-man front. And the more we can get in it, the happier I am. Now. Last year, you'll see a lot of odd because we were little up front. And the guys that we were developing were still young. This year, the th so we don't say we're in a four-man front. We have a joker backer that's our weekend and then three down linemen. My three down linemen will all bench over 300 pounds and all squat over 525. They all power clean over 250. So by God, we're going to be in a four-man front. Right? And I tell them all the time. They're like, Coach, God damn, why are we lifting all this weight? I'm like, we're going to be in a four-man front. Come hell or high water. Right? They are absolute monsters in the weight room. Now, one of them is 197 pounds. You think about what a 197-pound 17-year-old looks like that squats 535 and cleans 275. I mean, it looks like he swallowed watermelons on every extremity, right? He can stick gaps. He can take on double teams, but he's an athletic rascal, right? He can get in and out of things. So we like, as Coach and I were talking about, we like hybrid players. We like our D lineman to be able to play DN. We like our outside linebacker to play safety. We like our safeties to play overhang. Fundamentally, defense is about setting edges. If you can set an edge, you can determine where the ball goes. If you can't set an edge, the ball goes wherever it wants. Why do we run RPOs and why do we mix zone and gap? Because we, we violate your edge players. We take away your edge players' ability to be edge players. On defense, we set edges in different ways, as many different ways as we can. So we base from a 3-4 structure, that's our pressure package. We don't blitz as much from the 40. We do a little bit. We blitz a lot. Now I shouldn't say, well, RDC says we're blitzing when we bring a fifth guy. So any fifth rusher is a blitz to him. We like to get line stunt pressure on you. We like to steal gaps. We call it canceling gaps. And I can show you afterwards if you want to sit and talk. I'll show you some ways Iowa showed us to cancel out gaps. It's really pretty groovy stuff. Question of just curiosity, it's yep. not directly related. It's not office to office because you're in the U.S. where you're hiring staff, and we're in 
northern Canada where you'd be shocked at how hard it is to find coaches. Yeah. In the US. My, so anyways, my question though is, why did you hire a DC who philosophically was just totally different than you? <laughs> Great question. I like it. You want to know the honest answer? Yeah, I do. Because there ain't that many coaches who know what the hell they're doing in the states either. And so you either hire a guy that runs what you want, who's incompetent, or you hire a guy that's not maybe philosophically exactly what you want, but he's damn good at his job. My DC, he is damn good at his job. I mean, damn good. So what do you want to live with? You want to live with a guy that's not very good? Or you want to live with a guy that you got to argue with every three days, but he's damn good at what he does? I'd rather argue, right? Hire the best talent you can find and then win a lot of arguments. And honestly, I've won the ones I wanted because he was a straight zone drop guy. I'm a man match guy. And I won that fight. We are man matching everything now. So therefore, he gets to win more of the front conversations. But remember, I believe in head coach's prerogative. And he and I have had that clear cut understanding. I said, you run the defense until you piss me off. And then it is my prerogative to yell at you and make you stop and change things. And he understands that. There's times where he's like, hey, I don't know if we can, we can pressure here. I don't care. Bring pressure. I've had enough of watching them. Checkers and wreckers, man. Either they're going to score or we're going to score, but I've had enough. It's on me. Bring the pressure. Well, now it's not his problem, right? That's, that's chain of command. But that's an awesome question. I've never been asked that. Hire the best coach you can find. Don't get hung up in scheme. Because guess what? He coaches the 3-4 better than anybody I've ever seen. And he's made me, this is an interesting point, I've always been a 4-2-5, 4-3 guy. Now I find myself with cocktail napkins drawing up all kinds of 3-4 pressure. Because I'm like, well, damn, that was pretty cool. <laughs> I haven't seen that one in a while. So he's made me more 3-4, and I've made him more 4-2-5. Because I caught him the other day telling somebody, he's like, damn it, we're always sticking the wrong gap. Sometimes it's just better to get in the 4-2-5. I'm like, ah, right? Hey, there you go. He's like, you're an Move on, right? He didn't want to admit it, and I don't want to admit the 3 4 is better sometimes. But now we've got a good defense, right? I think arguing is healthy. I really do. I don't think yes man conversations make good staffs. I think you've got to have strife. I mean, that's why I piss my wife off, right? It makes your marriage spicy. I try to piss her off a couple times a week, right? Okay? But you've got to know boundaries, yes? You can't come home and tell your wife the spaghetti tastes like sh That's a divorce, okay? You can bitch about the sauce, but you better eat it, yes? So our staff has arguments. We have arguments, and I try to cultivate that. Now, there's a, there's a point where enough is enough, right? But I'll come in and I'll go, hey, this ain't working. Somebody better get, get pissed here. We gotta, yeah, we gotta have a conversation. Uh, so if it is harder to find staff than I thought, you got a staff member now that's just a terrible staff member. Uh -huh. How do you deal with it mid-season? Fire him. Who does the work? You. I fired my DC during homecoming one time. It was homecoming week. I told him to do something. He didn't do it. We'd had the conversation all week. I said, this is the last time. Wednesday. What if it's the superintendent's dad? Fire him and work on your resume. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have learned over the last 23 years, there are hills to not die on, right? When I was in my 20s, I tried to die on every hill. That leads to moving a lot. Now I've decided what hills to die on. And not every hill is one we have to die on. There's times I disagree with things our staff does and I don't like it, and I have the conversation. And we work to a better answer. There's just certain things that are non-negotiable. Some things you just can't change. And I tell our coaches all the time, I'm like, the last time I checked, the only people that we keep win-loss records on are quarterbacks and head coaches. So therefore, I am right. But you have a right to argue. But we'll argue before we get there. We're not going to argue on the sideline. We're not going to argue in the game. I think you'd be shocked at there are some phenomenally good coaches that are coaching football in the States. Phenomenally good, but there's some real bad ones too. It's a real dichotomy. Um, the reason I have a consulting business is because every staff has about two to three or four guys 
that really love the game and are dedicated to the game and understand it's a year-round process to be good. Then they got four or five guys that are just there for the season. They got another four or five guys that aren't very strong. We tell people we're the system for the three or four guys that understand it's year-round and they want staff development year-round. That's why we have a consulting business that works year-round. On my staff, half of my staff, when the season ends, that's it. We'll see them when, we, when I call a meeting in the spring. They're not around the kids. They've got jobs, right? Um, when I first started out, everybody was a teacher. Everybody on the coaching staff was a teacher. Now, I have 10 coaches. There's three that are teachers. 70% of my staff does something else. And so you can't expect them to be knee deep in this year round. They have real lives. So I've had to learn to balance that. I've had to learn to say, you may not be very strong on this point. You may be struggling, but why are you struggling? Part of it's because I'm probably not spending enough time teaching you what I really want you to do. Um, I've not fired very many coaches in 23 years, but the ones that I fired, I've never regretted it. If it's, if it's time for them to go, it's time for them to go. And I tell people all the time, sooner or later as a head coach, it's time for you to go. That's why you don't have guys that are at the same school for 25 years, because that's just not a thing anymore. Um, it's, it's a process, and you make people angry. So after a while, everybody goes. So we bring the kids in four days a week, four hours a day, all summer long. June 1st, all the way to August 1st. So just coaches, obviously. OC and DC and I? Yeah. Two to three times a week. Position coaches? Very, very rarely. So what I do is I bring the coordinators in and I say, hey, we had a good week of practice. These are the things we did. These are the things we did wrong, blah, blah, blah. I have that conversation with them and I say, now, you find time where the position coaches and you can meet. Because I call staff meetings for my time, right? Yeah. And I got one guy that's a police officer. I got one guy that's a county judge. I got another guy that has a construction business. It doesn't work for all of them. So I tell the coordinators, it's up to you to now take what I want and farm that back out to the position coaches. So um, we have a really big LDS, really big Mormon community where we're at. One of our coaches can't meet on Sundays. Like it's, it's a big no-no, right? Um, I'm Catholic. I go to church Saturday night, right? All's forgiven. Go on to the next day, right? Um, he has to meet at a different time with our DC. So I have to make a choice. Do I want him to coach? I could be a hard ass and say, well, nope, we have a staff meeting on Sunday and you got to be there. And if you're not there, you don't coach. 20-year-old me would have done that. 41-year-old me goes, he's a hell of a DB's coach now. He does a really good job with our kids. DC, meet with him on Saturday night and then bring his points to the meeting on Sunday and then that coach will come see me Monday if he has questions. So it didn't used to be that way, but I'm just telling you, it's so freaking hard to find coaches now. Like there's no, well, I shouldn't say that. There's pr the programs that have had sustained success and pay really well have got coaches. I got a friend in South Carolina has 26 paid assistant coaches, 26. He makes a hundred grand. And all of his coaches are making 10 on top of their teaching salary. That ain't normal. Okay, that ain't happening in Emmett, Idaho, let me tell you that. Like, I, as you and I are sitting here right now, I barely got my 10 coaching spots filled. And we start practice April 11th. And there's turnover every year. Every year. And I'm pretty demanding. So, it, you know, that's a thing too. What's the population of Boise? Boise has, well, the Boise Valley is about 40 miles wide. It's got about 750,000. So it's smaller, it's a smaller place. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, now when I was in Greenville, Greenville's 1.1 million. Okay. So. Huh? Oh, are they? Oh, we are. Yeah. Because I went to Idaho. Yep. All right, good questions. I love it. Um, so you can see there, we get quick, even answers. We say one word, and our kids will jump from 30 to 40. One word. Then another word is over, another word is under, another word is head up. One word moves all that. We want the fronts to move very quickly, okay? We can line up statically, we can stem, we can stick. We think we have to be balanced. One of the things that we get feedback 
because I'm, I like to talk to coaches, right? And I'm the secretary treasurer of the Idaho Football Coaches Association, so I get to interact with lots of people. One of the things I ask guys after they play us, if they're not mad at me, is I'll say, what gives you problems when you play us? And it's always a common answer. There's way too many places people line up, and it causes you issues. And the other big one, you run zone and you run gap. And the fact that we have to prepare for inside, outside zone and power counter is a problem. Okay? So therefore, we know that going the other way. My offensive linemen love it when I say, they're an Oki team. They're an over team. They're an under team. That's what we're going to deal with. It's very hard for an offensive line to deal with Oki, odd stack, over, under, slant, pinch. The more you do up front, the more time we have to spend on that offensive line. And they are a huge, does anybody here coach the offensive line? Yeah, they are a huge creature of habit, right? They don't like change. They are curmudgeonly angry people when they have to do things differently. They want to come out to the same mud bog with the same five-man blocking sled and do the same stuff every week. They don't want to change nothing. So now you say, well, they run this front and this front and this front and they stem to this and this. That's hard. So we do that. A lot of people don't. Yes, sir. Coach, are you a two-foot-two two team? Or, um, do you tell, tell me what that means in your vernacular. Uh, what I say is, do you, have, uh, uh, do you have guys play both ways or are they very separate? Okay, great question. Our O-line and D-line are not allowed to play both ways. My D-line are the backup O-linemen. My O-linemen are the backup D-linemen. So does my left guard have to play nose tackle? He better know what to do. He better know how to line up and help us. But he's not going to play unless he has to. We, so we, that's your philosophy. You it's my philosophy. philosophy. No. No. In the big schools we play, they'll have totally dedicated. We beat a team this year that we ran. So our offensive line's out there. We have six. We have six offensive linemen. Five starters, and we have one backup that's cross-trained to do everything. Okay? Then we have three D tackles, three D ends. Okay? Then they're, they're each other's backups. They had a defensive line they sent out, and we mauled it. So about eight minutes into the game, they sent a new one in. And then the next quarter, they sent another one in. They sent three line shifts in of 40 linemen. They had 12. We told our kids, I guess y'all are pretty damn good because you ran for six and a half yards per carry and we beat them. So wear out the next damn group they send in. But we don't think, because I did that in high school. I played O-line and D-line. Okay? And that is mortal combat. I hear receivers go, Coach, i got to run fade routes and then backpedal and play corner. I'm like, oh my God, how hard. Try playing three-tech and getting trapped and double teamed for 10 minutes. And then turning around having to trap and double team people for 10 minutes. That is war down in there. So our philosophy is O-lineman, D-lineman, separate. But everybody else is fair game. So my best receiver this year will start at safety for me. My best corner will also play some receiver for me. My dude middle linebacker will play a lot of fullback for me. Those guys, it is what it is. And about half of our starters, not O-line, D-line, will go both ways, significant amount of time. Um, and there's different philosophies on that. Some people are huge advocates of, hey, I'm going to have 22 dedicated starters, 11 and 11. If I can do that, I would love to do it. I would love to do it because I think if you spend two hours of practice with that kid at one thing, he's going to be a lot better. So philosophically, I, would, I want to do that. It's just reality doesn't let me do that. The best cover safety I have was also my best slot receiver. And if he didn't play both ways, we weren't going to win. So we had to play him both ways. Quarterback only played one game of defense last year. And we needed to win it, and he needed to play. And he had 11 tackles on defense, an interception, and then he ran for 250 yards and threw for 150 yards. And it was, by God, Superman, hop on. Get her done. So but a lot of kids on the bench. No, because we, have, we play three teams. So all of our freshmen play freshman ball. All of our sophomores, unless they're absolute studs, play JV ball. And then all of my juniors that don't get significant time go down and play JV. So I'll dress 
I'll dress 50 kids for a varsity game, and we'll play 30 of them, 35 of them. Um, the young ones, the sophomores, dress, but they are only allowed to play five quarters a week. So if you played four quarters on Thursday at JV ball, you're only allowed to play one on Friday. Is that your rule or That's a state rule. But I'll dress that kid because if it's a blowout one way or the other, I send him in there in the fourth quarter, right? Get him, get him some reps. I also, when we go to the playoffs, we allow anybody to dress and come with at once. The freshmen know they're never going to get in the game. They're never going to get in the game. But I'm going to tell you a little secret here. Playoff games, take all your young players, okay? Keep them after playoff practice. Y'all have playoff, some kind of playoff system, right? Okay, all your starters, send them home. When practice is over, last 30 minutes, send all your starters home. Goodbye. Take all your young players and practice them for 30 minutes and act like the starters are gone. You're stealing practice time, right? Coaches stay. And if he's my backup three-tech tackle, he's a sophomore, he ain't getting no reps, it's a playoff game. But that senior, send him home at 6 o'clock and say, okay, now you're the starter. We call it future football. And my coaches stay and coach those guys for 30 minutes. Well, now you just jumped way ahead for next fall because those kids got live time with you, right? It, it don't matter. Like my coaches are like, oh, well, this kid can't quite. I'm like, no one cares. Line him up at three technique and teach him how to play. Just coach him for 30 minutes. Hey, here's a thought. Learn his name. Because you probably don't know his name. He's hey. He's hey kid with the card. Get your ass over there and play scout team. Well, his name's Bill. Right? Let's, let's find out who Bill is. Let's find out whether Bill gets yelled at well or not. Like little things that just give you a chance. To, and I, I didn't know that for... 15 years, and the guy told me that. He's like, this is what we do. And I was like, oh, my God, duh. So then we started doing it. It's a great thing, right? Um, and we'll even keep the freshmen. Now, I, the freshmen get a choice. I tell them, if you want to go get ready for basketball, you can go. If you want to stay and play football, stay. And then you get to find out which freshmen are really bought in, too. Sophomores and up, if you don't come to the playoff practices, you ain't coming out next year. Okay, but that's a great way to steal time. All right, all right, next one, Coach. Okay, even structure. Uh, it can be a change-up or it can be standard in the game plan. There's some weeks we go in and we're like, hey, we're going to be an even team this week. We're going to be an odd team this week. We're going to mix it. It's very simple. Okay, how all that stuff I told you about anti-kiss be really, really complicated on offense, yeah, we don't do that on defense. We don't do that on defense. Complicated means you give a 50. Okay, who's got contain? Uh, if you get uh, ain't nobody got contain. You're going to get 70 scored on you. Okay? It better be coach, I got contained. Okay? I'm a big fan of who is Phil, who's contained, who's force. And my coaches that are below the age of 40 go, what the hell is force? I'm like, when this gives up contained and the ball is about ready to score, it's a kid that forces it back in or forces it out of bounds. And they're like, oh, I've never heard it called that. I'm like, that's because you're young. Right? That's a thing. If you're over 40, that's a thing. Okay? Uh, clearly defined responsibilities. Our kids have to be consistently told, this is your job. And our biggest problem, biggest problem on defense, somebody doing somebody else's job. Well, coach, I, yeah, I know I was supposed to be doing contain, but God, they were running the ball in the B gap. Well, hey, Einstein, now you're diving in the B gap. Do you understand why they just ran fly sweep for 700 yards outside of us? Oh, yeah, do your job. Don't do his job, do your job. God, we say that. It's like a broken freaking record. We say it a million times. Do your job. Do your job. No, not his job. Your job. What is your job? My job is contain. Then contain. Okay? You just got to keep hammering it. Gap control and covering the O-line is why we like to get an even. Okay? If you like to pull a lot, we want to cover people. We want to cover them up. If you're not a big pull team, we want to get an odd and we want to start changing gaps on you. Okay? That's basically how it goes. Miami and minor options. Miami means 4-3. Minor means 4-3 with a mic walking down. Miami's 4-3 with a true end coming in the game. I like being in Miami because I learned football as a 4-3 guy. So everything still processes as a 4-3 defense to me. Um, but that was a long fight. It, I mean, it's just finally this year we're using that more because my defense doesn't like that. They're all odd guys. They're all odd guys. My DC was the DC a long time ago left, I came in as a head coach, defense wasn't very good, I talked him out of retirement to come back. So now the old dog is learning new tricks. Okay, and he's doing, he's, I can't stress enough, it's phenomenal 
because he doesn't just agree with everything I say. I hate parrot coach, right? The one that just sits there and agrees with everything. That guy's useless. He does nothing. I also don't like asshole argue everything coach. Okay, they're equal problems. Okay, bring something constructive, but please don't agree with me all the time because I'm not that smart. Disagree, especially on defense. Under front to the boundary, a lot. We like to put the three technique to the field or to the back, it depends. Okay, if you're a big, I'm going to RPO the boundary team, then we'll set the three technique to the back. It's called anchoring it so that I can shove two linebackers into the boundary and hammer that run game. If you're a big, I want to play it out the other side, then we will line up in a lot of what we call Viper, double snake eyes, so that the linebackers are out of the pass fit. And I can show you that on the board. I will, this, this is one of those things, if you're a note guy and you like to write things down, the defensive line's alignment solves 90% of your coverage problems. If you play a shade five to the field, your Mike linebacker can line up outside the box. Right? Like, let's think about this is, this is the shade, this is the five, and I'm the Mike. I can play out here. I can fall all the way back to this gap. But if you put a three and a five, my gap's the A gap. I have to be stacked. Something we didn't know 10 years ago, okay? It's called the art of the light box. We're trying to make you think we don't have the run completely nailed down. But everybody's got responsibility. And then we do some really cool stuff where we spin a safety into the box late and we play cover three behind it and things like that. I love changing how quarterbacks, quarterbacks and offensive linemen, okay, this is our belief offensively, can kill anything they can identify. Okay, they've made way too much progress with quarterbacks. If the quarterback knows the coverage, he can beat it. If the offensive line knows the front, mine's going to beat it. I don't care what you tell me, we will beat it. But if we don't know it, we're not very good. That's the games that we lose, we lose because our, our offensive line can't ID the front correctly. You, you play too many games and we mess it up. The few times we throw an interception, because the quarterback is guessing where the coverage is, which is why we don't let him just stand there and throw drop back much anymore, because that's a guessing game. Okay, go ahead, coach. Okay, personnel. Now, this doesn't mean a lot, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, that's how we identify all of our players, but just to make it really easy for you, the joker is the boundary linebacker, the batman is the boundary end or tackle, the rock and the edge are the D lineman to the field, then we have a will, a mic, and a star. The star is the nickel. Money is the boundary safety. F is a field safety. And corners, we don't like that much anyway. So we just say you get a C. That's all you are. <laughs> okay. Now, we will flip the corners. One of, them, one of our corners is a bigger, stronger kid. And one's shorter and faster. So we will flip them based on matchup. But if it doesn't make a difference, then we don't move them. We like them to not move. Safeties move a lot. Because one of our safeties is a freaking guy, and he can cover ground. And one of them is not a guy, but he arrives with a badass attitude most of the time. So we like one of them to be more of a box guy and one of them to be more of a coverage guy. Okay? Are you running No. We are running, and I think he put it in the chart, we were about 70-30 too high to one high. But you would just spin down. Yeah, but when we spin to one high, we're Rip Liz like Alabama. Does. We're man match cover three. Yeah. So there's no spot drop. So you're running like you're, you're handling the vertical with the safety, spinning down. And yeah. Down the Every coverage we're in, first thing is, did we cap all verticals? Yeah. We never have an uncapped vertical. On, well, <laughs> theoretically, we never have an uncapped vertical. You'll see some clips where you're like, yeah, that's so much was uncapped as he runs by, right? But theoretically, everybody's capped. And our kids, when we went to man match versus spot drop, Everything was, who's got who vertical? Who's got two vertical? Who's got three vertical? Because that's all the offense wants to do. They just want to figure out where their vert ball is and get off the field. They just want to score and not put the work in. Okay? So you have to cover all those. And when I do the lecture tomorrow on man match, oh my God, y'all might want to dedicate three hours of your time because I'll go off on that. I love it. And I love all the ways that we match that. That's why people don't throw the ball on us very well. All right, next one. Um, there's our base. So if he calls Husky... We are head up, and the joker and the star are three by three. 
if he calls open, they're five by five, or they're apex. We're just widening them out more. If he calls Utah, it's a prevent. They're dropped back in the low seam area so they can carry seams better. But that's basically it. Now, he has ways, like if he calls reduction, that weak end will be over the guard. But if he does that, he's sticking people. He's going to stick and he's going to bring pressure. But those are his three base odd front calls. So if you just stripped it down, like the first day we installed defense, those are the three odd fronts our kids will learn. They don't know there's anything else until we get into the second week install. Okay, go ahead. This is the specialty stuff. So if he calls stack, um, we're going to be in a 3-3 look. If he calls eagle, we're in a bear. He calls it eagle, I call it bear. Um, and if it's reduction, you can see that Batman, the bee, has come in on the guard. And the Joker, he has a rule. If you ever are in the odd package and you have a tackle that is uncovered, that linebacker has to close. So our DC would say reduction is an odd front, not an even front. If you, may, if you said to him, what is reduction? Oh, that's part of our odd package. And it's the damnedest thing, because I'm like, coach, there's four. Four is even number. He's like, no. It's odd with the joker closing down on an uncovered lineman. And he'll die on that hill. And the kids are like, uh, I said, guy, don't, don't argue with his ass, OK? Yeah, because it's how it presents, right? And he played, he played defensive line at the University of Idaho. And he's a very, very large man. And when he gets pissed, I don't like watching it. So I just say, oh, yeah, coach, that's odd. Yeah, you're right. Nobody two gaps. That? Nobody two gaps. Okay. Why not one of them. Huh? Why, two yeah, gaps, why, why, why not? Why do you line them head up, head up if they're not two gaps? Because you don't know which gap they're going to. We're counting on getting our ass in the gap. You know you're strong. Yeah. So we, some of y'all are going to be pissed when I say this. We don't think high school football players can be two gappers. Now, somebody in this room has got a kid that's a two gapper. He's a guy and he can do it, right? But I don't. None of my guys are. Well, let me say this. I'm not going to take the time to find out. I'm going to take your big, strong, physical ass and I'm going to stick you in a gap and I'm going to cancel that one. And now I know which gap I got to deal with. Which is why I say, why don't we just line up in the 40? Because we're stunting to a 40. But you don't, but you don't two gap. Like, do you ever have, like, it would be like a heavy five, I guess, in the 40, where your guy is basically, it's a read gap. So if they're stepping away, now he's just taking what he's Oh, yeah. Doing. Yeah, we'll, we'll read the, the visual key. We'll read it and, and determine what gap we're taking. It's not, it's not like a physical two gap, but you can still see where you're we don't, we don't do this. We don't say... There's a guy, here's a guy, you got both gaps. Yeah, yeah. But we will say, when he steps, you have canceled this gap. Now, when the ball travels, take another one. Yeah. It's like the modern two gaps. Yes. Yeah. It, but we just don't, we don't trust them, and we don't trust ourselves to line up and say, you're just better to go get that gap. Because everybody we play is bigger than us. But now, I will line up in the 40, and I will give you the shade five, and then we will pirate a gap, which means we will give up contain. We'll tell our defensive end to come high hat and take the B gap right now. And our linebacker will play contain as he drops. Yeah, to the, to the boundary most. Now, what we've started doing this year is we started calling buccaneer, which means the DN just lines up in the B gap. He lines up in a four eye and takes it. And the mic... So if he's the four eye, the mic is out here playing contain. How do we get away with that? Because you don't call very good plays. You should run freaking outside zone speed option to that all day long. But you don't because your candy little ass wants to throw RPOs and throw drop back. So our mic drops back and he walls three. And we get away with it all the time. Because I fundamentally don't really respect what a lot of offensive coordinators do. You have to be balanced. Okay? I, if you're better than me, then it's not impressive you win. If you got better players, then you should win. And that happens. I'm not that good, right? Like, you've got 11 kids better than mine, I'm probably going to lose. I love that. I've been asked that question so many times. People go, Coach, what do you do if uh, they got better D linemen up front and they can play cover zero every play? I'm like, drink a beer. 
wait till next week. On to the next one. Because you ain't going to win. Right? But most OCs have tendencies. And you don't need a contained player every play. That's like, oh, my God. You should have seen my defensive staff when I told them that. You thought I'd come in and worship the devil. They're like, oh, my God, we've got to play contained. I'm like, yeah, no. You can play contained from odd places. Now you're forcing the OC to turn the next page of the playbook. Does he violate contain? Some of them never do. I see your defensive end in the B gap. The ball is coming that way. You can be sure as hell that ball is coming on pin and pull or outside zone now. Right now. I'm going to call it, and I'm going to call it, and call it, and call it. Because I ain't going to have you do that. Because that screws up a lot of stuff we do. But a lot of people don't do it. Coach, how much eagle do you want? Okay, so that eagle right there is our default answer to too tight. If you give us now, I was 100% wrong on this. Because when I hired our DC, I was like, we're going to get in head ups in a 40 front and play static defense, play 4 4 static defense. And he's like, give me one day and I'll convince you you never want to do it again. And I watched him run Eagle and I was like, you're right, I'm wrong. Done. So now we Eagle everybody. Like those double wing teams, done. Dead on arrival. We get in that and we roll both safeties down into what's called invert and they play the tight end. Tight end blocks down, come on. Now we got four linebackers, corners. But now the problem is we screw up every single year we play a double wing team, we will give up a play action corner for a touchdown. I mean, we just take bets on Sunday. We're like, which corner gives it up and which quarter is it going to be? Because we're giving one up, and we did. And actually, they gave us our only conference loss doing that. They beat us 8-7 to seven in a rainstorm. We shut them out, and they threw a 99-yard corner route on 3rd and 13. And our corner's just like, hey, look, that kid, one man route. Ten guys blocked, one man ran route. So I'm not a very good coach. But we held them to 71 rushing yards or something. That's embarrassing. And then we forgot one guy is running. You learn the double wing. Why do you think he's running vertical past you, son? Well, coach, I thought he was de decoying me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was. Decoying your intelligence. <coughs> okay, so yeah, Eagle, Eagle is our come home to mama in two tights. And we have a one word call. We don't even call it anymore. As soon as our kids see two tights, bam, they call it. And they get an Eagle right now. Even if they're in a 40, they jump out of it and they get into that. So that's been, it's been really good. All right, next one. This is his shade stuff, okay? Now, I had to make him do this because he calls over and under different than I call over and under. If I have a tight end in the game and you have a three technique to the tight end, that's over. Do we all, are we all good on that one? Does that hurt anybody's feelings? Okay, but I'll tell my linemen we're running to the under this week. It means we're going to pull to the shade. And so I talk like that, and oh my God, that, that overcooked everybody's grits. Everybody was in a bad mood. Because we're talking about being an over, but running to the under. So what we do is, if I want the three technique to the right, he'll call Raider. As soon as he says the word Raider, they're in a 40 front. They're head up on the guards. If he says River, the three techniques to the right. If he says Laker, three techniques to the left. Now it's set. Viper, they're in snake eyes, double A's. Booster, they're in double B's. Anything that ends in an R is a 40 front call. Done, end of story, move on. Makes life simple. Obviously, you're gonna be in booster if you're running line games, right? You're gonna be twist something, something back to the A gap. You're not gonna give them that, right? Now, we do have some teams that will not run the ball even when you leave double A gaps open. I, 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 I can't, can't figure it out. We tell our kids, if there's ever not 13 people in the A gap, my God, we're running the A gap. I mean, we, we dominate the A-gap. We actually have shirts made that say, and our linemen wear them to school, that say legends were built in the A-gaps. That's our home. Because we talk about all the time, the A-gaps is trench warfare. It is bayonet warfare. There ain't no smart bombs in the A-gap. Somebody's getting stabbed down there. And so we take those away. Hundred percent. Yeah. So what he'll do is, on the scouting report he gives them, there'll be default rules. So he and I, the first team we play, I can tell you what one of the rules is going to be. They never play with an inline tight end. It's like three times a game. So when they do, it is default three tech to the tight end. Done. Um, most teams, if they have a, a, a wing, 
tight end, why off the ball? We will over to that. Um, there are certain calls he'll make, like if it's trips into the boundary, he'll have a, like if the back is away from trips, he'll have a this. If the back is two trips, he'll have a that. Um, all that's in the scouting report. Yes, completely. The nickel ignores all that and plays his rule. Um, now what I put, the, I put the river and the laker in there because it's too damn much stuff for me to process when I'm snooping on their headset. And I start losing my freaking mind. I'm like, no, I want the three technique to the field. Then he can just go check laker, check river. So I put that in as a fail safe in case I'm pissed and I want to move it. But he's got it all scouting reported out. I would say that's probably the best thing our defensive staff does. They know everything you do. Everything. I mean, down to, he will watch every snap of every single game, break it down, and put it in a tendency chart. We will know, if you get into two backs, we will know what plays you run, what percentage of the time you run them, what gaps you run them to, which side boundary or field you run them to, and the numbers that you change the personnel group in, and it's all typed up for the kids on Monday when they walk in the door. They watch a stupid amount of film. And it's, I feel so bad for them because we're sitting with a big screen in the offensive room. We're like, I don't know, let's get in quads. Let's really piss with them. They've never seen this. And we're just playing around with them dry erase markers. And I go over to the defensive staff room and they all just look like burned out angry human beings because they're just data report after data report after data report. But that's what works. Our kids know what you are going to try to do. Our kids are never unprepared. Now, we can't physically always stop you, but we'll always know what you're doing. Yes, sir? Do you bring a wheel cat out of the booster, two by two on the flag? So, down here in the bottom right, we bring a wheel where? Wheel cat, so C gap lets out of the weak side. Yeah, so. So B goes A gap, slash J, slash N goes B gap. Yes. When I, when I do his stunts and fronts and pressures tomorrow, you'll see it. He's got one where the, bat, the Batman will step up and take exactly. contain, and Joker will take B. He's got another one where he'll go contain, he'll go A. He's got another one where they will both stick a gap, and the wheel comes off the exactly. edge. Then he's got one where they both fire and he takes A. He's got one where he goes C and he goes B. I mean, it's damn witchcraft. I get so sick of watching it. We just call power. We just put a tight end in the game and run their ass over. I get sick of it. Okay? But again, let me say this, because I, I think in clinic talk, people get all these highfalutin ideas, and they forget some of the base principles. Every good defense has an edge. Every good offense creates them. Every good offense creates them and manipulates them. If you are a 10P spread team, two by two, no tight end, no fullback, you have two open flanks of your own offense. It means you forfeited both edges to the defense. Did you not? They can get 4 4, they can get 3 4, they can go 4 2 5, play palms, play cover two, they can do whatever they want. Now, do I do that? Do I get in 10P? Absolutely. But don't do it too many times. Because we beat people all the time who give us two open sides of, of their offense. And we double edge them, and they can't go anywhere. They can't get outside of you. So you, we call it dragging them into deep water. We tell them where the ball has to go, and then we just pound and pound and pound on their players. And think about it. You play offense fundamentally because you're a finesse pretty boy. You play defense because you've got a bad attitude about life. So we're going to make your finesse guys go places they don't want to go. We're going to drag you right back down into the box. Now, if you use tight ends, you can't do that. So even if we don't have a tight end, we'll play with a tight end. We'll make a kid learn to play tight end because it, it fundamentally shifts how the defense has to present. All right, next. Um, these are even spread. Oh, so here you go. Cougar is his default answer, you were asking. That's his default answer to wing off. So if you have the Y off the ball, he calls Cougar, and that's how they line up. He plays a three. Now, if the Y were to step back on the ball, we'd play a three and a seven. If he underfronts that side, our joker knows he has to play a five when he has a shade. Does that make sense? And then we'd walk up a nine. Because, again, we're going to try to stop. Now, minor is the exact same front, 
but the mic is the extra lineman because our mic's a thumper. He's a big, strong kid. And so sometimes we just want to walk him up there and put a matchup on your tackle because he can outrun your tackle. Only reason why he's a linebacker. He already knows how to contain and he already knows how to rush. So don't put him down there in trench warfare. Put him on the edge where he can be athletic. And your stand was gap. So really gap. So no. So our we call him a star because he's a nickel and we don't want him to be in the run fit unless we put him in the run fit. Now we have calls where he is, but he is divorced from the front. There are six dedicated box players. So he's more in your secondary, but what's really tricky about coaching him is he has to go with the linebackers and he has to go with the DBs. I can't play in my league without a nickel because so many people spread us out so different ways. If I don't have five DBs on the field, I can't, I can't create all the coverage options I want. But that kid's my starting tailback. He's, he's a freaking guy. He is a mean little rascal. And he's not more than about 5'7", five, 5'8", five, jacked up, yoked up, quick, mullet. Just bad, bad human being. I mean, I'm sure you know like, the differences in the regular game versus the mm -hmm. so, like, like a lot of times, yeah. like the horse you buy principles and stuff like that, they apply a lot, especially with the horse front and the secondary. Um, yeah, so I uh, just... In, in your game, I would be double nickel all the time, which we tried to tell our kids is a dime, and they just look at us like they're confused. Like, two nickels is a dime. Like, these are fun conversations. You know, funny is you say that I never thought about why they called a dime in my life, and you just said it there, so. Learn something new every day, right? So we'll tell our guys, we're in, like, if I was, if, if you just ripped me out of Idaho and moved me to the 12-man game, I would be double nickel all the time. And I would find those two players before I found anybody else. Because once they're in the game, the coverage options are limitless. I can play zero, I can play one, I can play ripless thirds, I can play six. Cover six is our base coverage. I can tra play true four umbrella, I can play palms, which is read two. I can do all that if the nickel is able to do it. And we tell our guy, if you can't run with them, then you better be able to beat them up. And he's an important guy. And his backup's an important guy. Because if he goes down, you lose half your coverage options. So we train two every year. We always have two nickels. And one of them just goes and finds another home, because obviously the starter's better. But he knows what to do. All right, next. Those are formational checks. So when you were asking about, he names all the things they get into something. And I hate every part of this. So I just don't listen because I am a personnel guy. I'm like, well, that's 12P. And he's like, no, that's Irish. I'm like, why is it Irish? Well, because I had a beer one time with this Irish guy and he really loved 12P. I'm like, oh my God, stop. And it's always some dumb answer. It's always something like that. Coach, why is splitbacks Texas? Well, because I was watching Vince Young one time on TV and he had splitbacks as I was thinking. And that's it. Okay. And he tells the kids this, and somehow the kids believe it, and so I'm like, okay, I'm just walking away. Like, I don't argue, right? But that's all this stuff. And he had it typed up for you without the personnel cheat sheet underneath, and I'm like, please don't do that to people. Put it underneath there. So you can see what it is, right? Longhorn is 22P, but it's two by one. So I, he, I made him, and he hated me for it, but that's okay. I made him go back and, and add all that, okay? So that's how he gets things in based upon his call. So he'll tell the kids, when you see Irish this week, our default answer is Viper. So on their sheet, it'll say Irish equals Viper. Well, now they just check to that, and they know. And then if he doesn't like it, he'd go, no, check River, or check Husky. Like, he can check out of things. No, he's just that loud. <laughs> yeah. So they're not, they're not wearing wristbands and looking at nope. the balls. They're, they see it, they make the call, and he's like 6'5", 280, and has a voice like a damn foghorn. And he's just like, no! Jack up! We sound so stupid. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're walking up, they, they identify it, and then he, we call it overrides. 
so he will override them. The DB coach will sometimes override the coverage, but not very often. Not very often. Like, he'll lose his mind sometimes, and he'll be like, you guys got to get out of too high. And he'll try to override it. But the DC is actually... Now, we're sending him to the box for the first time because he's about two inches from getting thrown out of every game. And so he needs to go drink decaf. Are you going to hear him from up there now? Oh, God, it's going to be worse. It's going to be worse. Because now I'm going to have to listen to it on the headset. But our, uh, our linebackers coach is a very flat line guy, right? Just very calm. So he's going to call it now from the sideline, and our DC is going to be chained to a desk. We'll see. It'll last one quarter, and he'll be down there. Huh? Yeah, yeah. It's, I'm just assuming he comes out of the box before the half of the first game, so it, it, it won't last long. But it's a theory. We'll waste a lot of time on it. Okay, go ahead, Coach. <clears throat> There's his call sheet. Okay, so we beat, you can see there the date. These guys were number one in the state, and this was kind of his piece de resistance. Uh, this was his masterpiece. Um, we shut these guys out when they were ranked number one in the state. So I said, pick a good game plan, and of course, that's the one he picked. Um, that's what his game plan looked like that night. That's the actual call sheet. He took a picture of it and then put it in there. So that's all he has in his pocket when he goes to, goes to the game. So you can see there's not a lot, not a lot there. Now he can call his own pressures, he can call his checks, but that's what he's doing. So coach, you, uh, you line up uh, like personnel in front for, for formation. Do you blitz the formation as well? So Sometimes. Yeah. We're not big blitz guys. Um, that's one thing when I hired him, we both agreed to. We're not pressure guys. Um, we need to do it more. We need to start bringing a little more, but we philosophically believe that if the defense lines up correctly and tackles, you win most games. I know that sounds like an oversimplification, but what's that? Yeah, you've got to be athletic or you've got to be risky. And we're not savants. So we condition our kids to understand we're going to play gap sound defense. We're not going to blow coverage and we're going to line up correctly to everything you do. So then you've got to beat us. Um, we'll bring more pressure this year because our back end is better. But our I corners know, and safeties I are better. I see, if I see a team pressuring a lot, I'm going to, I'm going to want to motion or shift or change up so I feel like I can check them out with their blitzes. And I guess what I'm asking is, um, like, uh, do you plan to um, like blitz the formation, like have uh, your pressure set up as per what the... the no, the very rarely. So the way he pressures people is early in the game, it's almost non-existent and then he finds the tendency he wants to pressure. And he literally works it from front to back. He will line stunt you first to take it away, then he'll single man blitz you, then he'll zone pressure you, then he'll secondary blitz you, then he'll zero you. He literally works it all the way back. And I've watched him coach for about three years now and pressure's almost not, like he never has, any pressure he has on there is a lie. He's not really gonna do it. He's going to tendency you out. He's going to find out when he can blitz and get away with it. We're going to play a lot of vanilla safety. Now, coverage, that's a whole other thing. We, we will throw everything but the kitchen sink at you coverage-wise. We just don't believe in blitzing. It's just not our, not our jam. Because we think the OC's got ready-made answers. Um, there ain't very many ready-made answers today. They just keep lining up and playing sound defense. He has to keep calling good plays. And we think... Not many people can play eight, nine, ten plays in high school football. Now, the flip side is that's exactly what we're doing. We're telling our kids, well, you're going to hold the ball for 10, 11, 12 plays and matriculate it down the field and score. And if they bring pressure, these are your answers. And it's kind of a, kind of a twisted logic, but that's what we do. All right, now, this is a little bit um, of a breakdown chart-wise for you. Um, he only had time to do it for 2021. We forced less turnovers in 21 because we led the state in forced turnovers in 20. We picked, them, we picked people off 23 times, I think, in 20. Um, we are number one in the state. So people just quit taking shots on us. And so we got way less turnovers and less sacks in 21. But you can see there, heavy, heavy zone team. We only played man 8% of the time. Now, I would contend that's not true because we're a man match team. So we're actually playing man 99% of the time. It's just presenting to you like zone. 
two highs 62 percent of the time that one high would have been 99 to 1. they would not run one high before i came to emmett they were totally against it now, i'll also blow your mind i think on this one we believe two high stops the run and we believe one high stops the pass we are exactly opposite of what you read in the textbook because two high the way we do it lets our safeties fit as edge players in the run one high the free safety's high he's out of the run fit completely okay and so we're really dedicating five when we're in one high and only four when we're in two high so i can draw that for you later and show you but we stop the run in two high we stop the pass in one high then odd and even that will pull a little closer this year um, that's me not really forcing much of the issue um, you can see there he got in even a good bit even though he's not being directed to um, i would say that's probably more 64. he'll still go back to the odd a lot and, and i and i'm not going to fuss too much because fundamentally i think coaches are good at what they are comfortable calling and i've seen this so many times guys are like oh i have to become an air raid guy you can't teach it oh i have to become a power guy you can't teach it if you don't hear anything else i say that would be my advice call what you're good at teaching again that probably you're probably sitting there going well no sherlock that's pretty obvious it ain't obvious i see people all the time trying to put a square peg in a round hole and they're awful i cannot teach triple option if i could that's what i'd run because it is the absolute definition of horrifying for a defense i'd have two more i'd have i'd probably have a state championship from my previous school if we didn't have to play a triple option team we had dudes i mean we had freaking dudes and we'd go out there and we'd look great defending the triple and then we'd get to the game and hey son why'd you not take dive oh yeah i was supposed to take dive yeah because that's all you're doing all week is taking dive Why'd you not take dive that 37th time they ran dive? Oh, I just decided to get the quarterback. Boom! There goes the fullback. And it doesn't matter whether you have talent or not. The problem is, I'm awful at it. I'm awful. I can't teach it. So we don't run triple option. I'm really good at teaching RPOs. Really good at teaching gun and under center mixture stuff. Surface. I just run what I'm good at. I mean, that's, to me, that's how you win games. Yep. How many of your kids play uh, pop order prior to uh, most. high school? Most. Most. Because quite honestly, I see high schools, I see minor league here trying to force a zone, and they ain't got the, the players to do mm -hmm. it. Are you playing it because you got the athletes to do it, or just because you oh. figure it's better? Are we playing zone because of it? We're playing zone because we want to stop the run. I want 11 eyes focused this way. Now, my Pop Warner kids, they play a ton of man because they can't play zone. Well, that's what I see up here, regardless of, and all due respect to high school coaches, zone is up here. Mm -hmm. Well, is it easier to play man or easier to play zone? easy you got him right the problem is the OC it ain't hard to call plays it's really easy to call plays when they play man it either works or it doesn't um, I would say the best thing about our defense is the fact that every coach on our staff understands we are built from the back up the best four players I have play corner and safety well I should, the best player we have is going to play quarterback. Then, the best four skill players we have are playing DB. The best three big guys we have are playing D-line. We build the defense first, and the defense gets all the draft picks. Well, right? that makes sense. And those guys are, I mean, we work on it, and we work on it, and we work on it. But there's a ton of man principles in our zone. When we start matching, this guy runs this route, man, he's yours now, done. I would actually contend there is no zone. There is no zone. Man is you have him right now. You're buying him right now. Zone is you're buying him on demand. When he does this, you've got him. But getting kids to understand that, not easy. It took us three years. I mean, it didn't come out of a box like this. I've been trying for 10. 
I, when we do coverage tomorrow, I got some cheats for you. I'll give you that's really helped us because I understand our coverage best of all. That's where I spend them. Like when I go to mess with defense, I go to mess with coverages. I've got good guys for the box. They know how to gap fit, but I spend a lot of time on that. Okay, so what I had him do, I'm oh, sorry. What I had him do is he created a montage of a couple games of plays where we held them to three yards or less. That's his standard. <clears throat> so that you can kind of see how he does it and why he does it. Obviously, they got more than three there. But these are plays where the defense was generically successful. These guys are a big pro style team. You can see there how we're matching routes. That's zone. That's zone, but it looks like man. Pause that right there. Roll that back. Now, that, pause right there. That is man match cover three. So if I was to teach our kids off that clip, I would say to the corner, you have all of one vertical. That's the first thing I'm going to say to him. You have all of one vertical. That safety is in what we call Tahoe alignment. He's an outside leverage. And I'm going to say, you have all of two vertical, but you're reading, you're bracketing two to three. You have first to the flat, right? Free is free. He's over the top. So the nickel, the kid that's inside of three, he is walling three vertical, but in the other leverage. He's in what we call Carson leverage, inside leverage, okay? So the free is actually cherry picking two and three vertical. He doesn't have either one. So how many dedicated players are there? There's five for four, okay? This is dumb, but this is what we do. However many receivers you have to a side, we have to have one more than you have. If we don't, we're in man. So let's just be in cover zero and be in man. Well, there I have four covering three. The nickel, the roll down safety, the corner, and the free are all dedicated to covering three. The corner on the backside has the tight end. In cover three. But really, man, because we don't have a flat defender. And we tell our kids all the time, that's a vacant flat. Now, that is the freaking hardest thing to get high school kids to do, is say, son, this is me, like Jack is that corner up there. Jack, that tight end in the flat is vacant. He's open. He's catching an out route. Jack, don't cover the out route. Don't ever cover the out route. He can run an out, Jack. Got it, Jack? Yeah. Second out route. Here he comes. Covers it. Now you're going to give up a wheel you got to hammer it and hammer it and hammer it. There are certain routes we are going to give them. We're going to give them, and we're going to figure out whether you're really willing to take it. They're never going to throw that out route to that tight end. They did it one time. He caught it. We shoved him out of bounds. Great, you got six yards. Your mom's happy. They didn't do it again. So what are we covering it for? He's a big, tall, long strider. He runs corner routes and seams. Take those away. If he wants to throw out routes, let him throw out routes. Go ahead and play it. Now you've got the box covered up, right? Now you've got seven hitters in the box. Look at that. There ain't a whole lot of places to go with that ball. Now, if he completes that comeback, oh well, because we're playing thirds behind it. If you complete it, you complete it. It's high school football. You ain't completing half of them. Okay, if he catches it, what happens? We tackle him for five. Right? Those guys don't care. They're, they're free hitters. That's how we talk to them. We're like, you're a hitter. What's that mean? You go to the quarterback. You can't get to the quarterback? Stop. This tailback that you see here, he's going to Boise State. He averaged 260 yards rushing per game. On us, 81. Worst game of his career. We made him throw the ball. Once they're one-dimensional, you just get after their ass. Just get after their ass. One word answer. We're an eagle right there. Got everything gapped. Are we vulnerable to the pass? Absolutely. Play that one again, coach. The kids all week. Coach, we're so vulnerable to the pass. We got everybody in the box. Yeah. Yeah, great. And our kids, pause it when he catches this. Pause it. Right there. Our kids, the next, the next series are like, coach, you sure you don't want us to cover that out route tighter? I'm like... Uh, no, I don't. 
their back rushes for 260 yards a game. They can throw frickin' out routes all night. We don't have that close. I don't care if it's high school or minor, we don't have that close. Don't have what? What do you mean? Where you see your defense coming on that. Oh, coming down closing? Yeah, and that's, that's what we mean by matching routes. Once that route is identified, run the route. You're a receiver, run the route. You got much right to the ball as he does. Go ahead and play it. Who, who cares? That's the, that's the biggest thing you got to get kids to understand is there's certain things we just don't care about. Stop the run, take away the deep ball, make them, make them dink and dunk around. These guys were very predictable with what they did with their tight ends. Their tight ends told us everything. Now that, we didn't match that dig route. Did you see that? I don't want you to sit here and think, oh my God, he's got all the answers. His kids do everything right. Hell no. We're wrong half the time. Play that one again. I like that though. That rascal's so slow, he couldn't play dead in a cowboy movie. Okay? But he knows where to go, right? Now, we are... Pause. We're in trap coverage right there. We're in cover two. We're not in cover four. So all's the, I, I'm not that smart. What's the difference between cover two and cover four? It's cloud and sky. So it's just who has a flat. Corner has a flat. As Soon as he sees the flat violated, come eat, right? Go ahead and play it. Kachow. Yeah, you got a yard. Great job. He, if we are in palms, he is what we call a Cali alignment. He is walling the final two and pushing to the final three. So he's not going to expand unless three takes him out. He's going to drop with, now check this out. If if this is the receiver facing me, I'm going to play two and four with head-up leverage. I'm not going to cheat in or out. If I'm playing cover four, I'm going to bail to inside leverage. If I'm playing trap, if the, if the flats violate, I'm going to assume outside leverage through him. Do you, do you bail to the like, inside shade, but it doesn't depend on the alignment? Do you, like, do you have your, like, your, uh... If two goes vertical past linebacker depth, yeah. no matter which coverage it is, I'm going to inside leverage and taking one vertical, and we're done. But if one or two goes to the flat within five, six yards, basically, I'm trapping it and coming out. Yeah. And that's based off of the receiver release, though. All based on what two does. We're eyes all over two. Two's going to take us to the party. See, we, we were talking about this earlier. You're moving position. Mm -hmm. That's why you guys are leaving. Because he's not running. He's running and starting over the zone and going to the back because of the assignment that has been given to him. The, the route is telling him what to do. His, his guy is telling him what to do. Rather than having covering grass, we call it a retarded zone. Mm -hmm. Go zone man coverage to assign him. 100%. 100%. Now, switch over real quick, Coach, just so you can see a spread team. These guys are really pro style. There's one in there that says Columbia, less than three. Uh, I may have to scroll down. Oh, there it is. I'll just show you a couple clips of this, and then we'll take another break because we've got one more to do. Um, these guys are a little more spread happy. Um, they try to get physical with some multi-back stuff. It doesn't work. There's a little 40 package. That's some 4 3, cover 3 stuff. But you're typically not going to run your palms or two reads to a trip set, right? Oh, yeah, we will. So we will, we will palms your 1 and 2 and poach your number 3 off the backside. Mm -hmm. And we play a 5A school out of Coeur d'Alene this year, and they got a freaking dude. Um, and we'll do that to them. We'll palms them. And then we'll, we'll cap that kid and we'll bracket him with two. We'll play under and over, and he won't catch the ball. So you're, you're overhanging, basically playing man, but he's able to Yes, but when he, loses, when he loses that kid vertical, the safety will take him. So that guy can drop back to the box. So I get an extra fitter in the box. Is that like solo? Yeah. Yeah. Where you call your guys? Where do you box? On which one? 
But I guess what would you say, like, after this point, even if he goes up, it's considerable? When he clears linebacker depth. Okay, so like five to seven. And that doesn't hurt us very often, but sometimes it does. Yeah. Sometimes that kid's like, well, he was kind of, you know, that, well, he was kind of. Yeah. We tell them if it's kind of, you're in quarters. Yeah. The, the route that we don't like, and that's why we run it so much, is the over. Like, we like to come off play action and bring one over the linebackers. That's nasty. We, we always cap it so that it can't go over the top and kill us. The problem is, is getting the linebacker back underneath. We run it off play action almost exclusively. So we will pap to that a hundred different, literally a hundred different ways. Two in the boundary, four nickel to the field. But it's hard. Doesn't matter what you teach, it's still really hard. 